Hey everyone, sorry it took so long to get started. Uh, we had a few technical issues that were caused a little bit by myself, but we figured it out in the end. So thanks for being patient and waiting for us. My name's Craig Williams. I am the Senior Technical Manager for Amatech Solid State Controls here in the Stafford, Texas office. And let's start off by saying to everybody that is in the Houston area, um, I hope you are staying warm um, and that you have power and water and all those kind of good things, because I know a lot of us don't. Uh, I was just looking at the Earthcop website earlier on today, and it's saying 46% of Houstonians have power. The other 54% do not. So also, um, there is a possibility that I might get cut off somewhere during this um, webinar. Um, but fortunately, I'm not the one presenting today. The one presenting today is Don Imlay. I'm just about to hand it over to him. And today's webinar is about factory acceptance testing and startup services, services the difference between both. And um, uh, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. You can use the chat bar um, if you uh, want to answer, ask, sorry, ask a question. You can use the chat bar to ask a question. Um, we tend to leave the questions until the end of the presentation, um, and we will get to them then. Um, the platform that we use is Webinar Jam, um, and this platform has a panic button. So if for some reason the, the webinar gets locked up, what we can do is we can press the panic button and that creates a new room and we'll invite everybody back into that room and we will start where we left off. So that's a really good function. Um, and before I hand it over to Don, I just always like to ask, can everybody hear us? Um, if everybody just type in the chat bar, if you can hear us say, yes, I can, that would be awesome. And that leads me to my last point. Um, there is a little bit of a delay from when I speak to when you will hear it out there on the web because Webinar Jam has to turn it into a web-based platform, a um, Android-based platform, and a uh, Apple-based platform. So it takes about 15 seconds to uh, for you to hear my voice after I've said it. So there will be a little bit of a delay. But without further ado, I will hand you over and let uh, Don do his introduction. So uh, I'm going to hand you over to Don Imlay, who is our training manager, and he's based in our Columbus office. Thanks very much, Don. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm checking in from Columbus, Ohio, where it was a balmy uh, 11 degrees Fahrenheit this morning uh, when I left. Um, I did come into the office here. Um, to uh, do this, I've been working from home. Um, I came in because there's less distractions, hopefully, here. So anyhow, uh, I'm the uh, training manager here at Amatech Solid State Controls. I've been here, uh, I say three decades, it's probably closer to four, 30-some uh, years anyhow. And in the time period I've been here, uh, I started out testing uh, UPSs, uh, did uh, a lot of uh, service calls uh, as a field service engineer. Uh, I've acted as a train, uh, service manager, technical writer, uh, designed some circuit boards, training instructor now, and I tend to be the general gopher uh, for whatever we need, uh, the interface between the field and uh, the technicians in the factory and so on. Um, what we're going to do today is understand the difference between factory acceptance testing, which is what we call FAT, and what we do on site when a uh, system uh, shows up, uh, startup services. Before we go into uh, all of that, I want to just do a quick uh, review on uh, what a UPS is. Um, as we build them, uh, we call them double conversion UPSs. Uh, there's other topologies, but this is what we feel is best for industry and so on. So uh, we're going to start in the bottom left-hand corner where it says AC input. Typically, that's 480 volts, three phase. It goes through a transformer into a battery charger. We step down the AC 
into a usable level, uh, rectify it to DC and charge a battery. And in most applications, this DC voltage is going to be a nominal 125 volt uh, DC. And a typical battery um, would be a lead acid type, uh, 60 cells, uh, charging at 2.25 volts per cell, which works out to 135 volts DC. We take that DC, run it into an inverter, and the output of the inverter can be single phase, three phase, uh, in a few cases we'll do split phase. It can be 120 single phase, it can be 120, 208, 480 volts here domestically, and then on other sides of the planet, uh, what are voltage and frequency you have there. So the output of the inverter feeds a static transfer switch. And the actual switch uh, you might see there is made up of pairs of SCRs or thyristors, whichever you like. Normally the inverter connects to the load um, through the static switch and on then through a manual bypass switch. Up in the upper left hand corner, we see the bypass source that comes in. That's like a standby source of power. And we feed that into the system and the inverter synchronizes to it and uh, allows then if we need to, to swap the load between the inverter and the bypass source. Coming out of the machine, we go to a manual bypass switch. This is a rotary switch, and uh, its primary purpose is for maintenance purposes. It allows us to completely bypass and isolate the UPS cabinet. For most systems today, um, this switch is in its own separate cabinet mounted on a wall, and in doing so, it allows us to completely isolate the UPS cabinet so we can do maintenance on it safely and get all the power off of it. So that's pretty much the accepted standard uh, for new equipment these days. So um, the purpose of FAT then is to ensure that uh, the system meets the specifications. Okay, uh, every job we do is a uh, somewhat customized for somebody's specifications. So when we come to the factory um, for uh, acceptance testing, uh, we want to make sure it meets the spec. Um, we look at the drawings, make sure they're accurate. Uh, we verify uh, operating procedures and tags meet expectations. Uh, some sites, for example, may refer to a bypass source. Some sites call it an alternate source. Um, little things like that we can change if we need to. Um, taking care of this stuff during factory acceptance testing makes it an awful lot easier to accomplish um, rather than waiting till we get out uh, on the site. Um, once an order hits the production floor for a new system, we build up sub-assemblies sub and install them in the cabinet. And along the way, we have what we call a unit history log. And it tracks any part shortages, um, any discrepancies, if there's a wiring error made, uh, anything that happens along the production system. Uh, it gets documented there, and we keep this then. And sometimes we refer back to it when the machine gets out in the field to, to see if there's potentially an issue there. Um, once the system's built, uh, quality control goes over it with a fine tooth comb. And they check cables, and they check clearances, and make sure we don't have uh, any kind of cable going over a sharp edge anything like that. From there, we move it to the test bays. Of course, access is limited to uh, certain personnel in the uh, test bays. And 
Uh, certainly we have uh, PPE that's required um, to operate uh, or to go into the test space. Here's a picture on the left of a uh, one of our ferro resonant uh, UPS systems being tested. And in the far left of that picture, there's uh, some manual bypass switches, remote switches um, in the uh, test bay getting ready to be tested. On the right is a um, one of our uh, digital uh, control UPSs here. And um, I just happened to snap this picture uh, to put in here, but uh, this is kind of something unique about this one here. There's a, um, a folder bolted onto the door for the, um, for the drawing. So the, the end user must have specified they wanted this and so they can store the drawings uh, right there in the machine, which is a good idea. Uh, you always got the drawings there. Maybe they're going to have operating procedures in there, something like that. And in this picture, you all see uh, uh, there's some test equipment uh, right there. They're going to hook up. That's a power line monitor on the uh, black cabinet there that uh, they record waveforms and things like that. With. So each test bay has a patch panel with uh, power sources. There's uh, three phase 480 volts, uh, 12208, uh, 125 volts DC, and we can patch in uh, 250 volts DC if we need to. Um, there are also connections for load banks. Um, we keep load banks outside the building because usually you don't want the heat in the building. Right now, that would be kind of welcome to uh, have those load banks in the building. Um, the system is inspected by uh, the testing technicians or wiring errors, loose connections. And this will be about the third inspection that's done to the machine before they even start to power it up. This is when we do um, any UL testing, uh, like uh, dielectric tests, uh, surge withstand tests, uh, things like that. Then the test technician will bring in temporary power uh, to the system and initialize software. And if there's any um, system parameters, like uh, maybe set points for alarms, things like that, all those get loaded in. So uh, again, here's uh, on the left is a picture of a system uh, this is a highly customized system. I think going to end up in a nuclear plant right there. And uh, another picture of the uh, remote manual bypass switch, uh, the smaller little box sitting on the floor there. Picture on the right is just more um, patch panels uh, where they cable everything, uh, cable it in right there. Um, when we bring the machine up, First of all, uh, we've got uh, variable AC power supplies, as otherwise referred to as a variac, that we bring into the AC input. And we bring that up slow, monitor voltages and currents uh, to make sure we don't have any faults or anything like that, and get the charger up and going. And um, once the charger starts up, then we take an oscilloscope and hang it on the output of the charger to make sure it's uh, working properly. So in the picture here on the left, um, there's missing pulses right where the arrow is at. And uh, that was, uh, this is just one that was taken, uh, picture was taken. The re reason is the two uh, wires for the um, SCR are reversed. So we got an SCR not turning on in the charger. And so uh, we found that with the scope and then corrected it. It's just reversing the two leads. And in the right screen, that's the proper waveform we're looking at when all the pulses are there. So once the charger is operating, then we can start on the inverter, get it up and going 
and then we check out the uh, static transfer switch. And this is just to verify basic operation of everything at this point. From there, depending on the specifications and the requirements of the test, um, we'll start going through the whole process. Um, I should note here, we do not do type testing on UPSs. Every machine is built to a specification. It gets a full battery of tests. And sometimes that can take days to accomplish, but that's what's required. Once we get it up and going, um, we'll put full load on the system and it runs for a minimum of 12 hours at rated load. And that's 100% whatever it's rated for. If we get this ready early in the day, um, then uh, the test technicians will go through and continue on with the alarms and so forth. If it's late in the day and they just get the machine turned on, we check it out, make sure it's good, and then get it on the heat run overnight. Um, here's a uh, sample test data that we, uh, I grabbed uh, just off a machine that was on the floor. So after the heat run test, while the machine is still uh, hot and still at full load, they take thermocouples and also an infrared uh, camera. We use the infrared just to look for hot spots. And then with the thermocouples, we take um, temperatures of different components. So uh, there at the top, uh, there's an arrow pointing to ambient temperature. Uh, room temperature of the machine was 22 degrees C. Now, if the spec requires that we build, uh, we put up walls around the machine and uh, we can elevate the temperature. Sometimes it's 40 degrees C, occasionally 50 degrees C. This machine didn't require it. So it was uh, ambient temperature was 22 degrees C. And there in the middle, we see a uh, transformer, TF1 and TF2, TF3. Um, transformer one uh, was at 90, the windings were 92 degrees centigrade. Now that seems kind of hot and it is pretty warm, but relative to the spec, which you see there, magnetics maximum temperature is 170 degrees. Now, mind you, this machine's been running for a uh, minimum of 12 hours, or if you look at this one at the very top, uh, we see it was uh, operating 44 hours at uh, full load when this came in. So um, we're sure we've got this thing heated up and our transformers well within specifications. On down from there, we see the uh, charger SCRs um, are running at 50 degrees C. And that's considered cold, although, although it'd be awful warm to the touch. Um, that's cold relative to semiconductors. And you see our spec says it's got to be less than 80 degrees C. It's worth noting that the typical uh, rated junction temperature of a thyristor is 125 degrees C or more. So we're, our spec for acceptance is well away from the actual rating of the device. And then the SCRs here are well away from the maximum temperature. So we know this thing's going to go out there and just run and run and run for years and not have any trouble. Um, on the right here of the screen is just some of the tests um, that they do. And there uh, may be LEDs um, uh, for certain alarms um, that may show up on the LCD on the screen uh, and just different uh, alarms and set points and so on. That's all part of the test right here. And there may be pages of these. This is just a sample right here. Um, here's more uh, charger uh, test data. 
uh, here is um, just getting uh, all the currents and voltages uh, at different AC inputs and so on. And something we always look at where the arrow is pointing to is the AC input current. And in this case, the absolute value is not critical, but it's the fact that they're all balanced. And that's what's important here. Um, we want to see a balanced current. Again, that tells us the charger is working OK. Uh, here's some more uh, data on the right side of the screen here. Um, charger current limit right here. Um, the uh, maximum output current available from the charger, 165 amps. And on this machine, we've also got a battery current. That limits how much current will go into a battery when we're recharging. That's because the manufacturers typically uh, will have a, a spec of maximum current they want to put back into the battery uh, to keep from overheating it on uh, recharge. Um, here's more uh, test data on the inverter at the top. Inverter regulation, which is uh, looking at the output voltage and uh, current under load and at various DC input voltages. Down below is a, um, a test we do. And I've point, got an arrow pointing to the short circuit test. This is a short circuit we put on the output of the machine. And what they do is they take a hundred foot of cable to uh, simulate uh, cable drops um, going to the distribution panel. And uh, they close in uh, a breaker and fault the output um, to simulate a real world, real world fault right here. And so it, it says here, yeah, they did the test and it passed. So I had to clear the fault. So as of March of 2020, uh, when the, the COVID-19 hit everything, um, we had to shut down actual real-time witness testing and uh, started doing everything uh, via uh, the internet. So um, they all, everything's been done virtual since then. So factory acceptance testing essentially duplicates the, all the tests that we've done thus far. So we'll check alarms, we'll check the regulation of the charger, we'll do the overload testing on the inverter, and all that sort of thing. Um, sometimes there's minor changes made again uh, in labels and tags, uh, things like that. What we're going to see here uh, coming up um, is a bunch of oscillographs uh, that we take just to confirm that the machine uh, is functioning properly. Here is a picture of a couple of the test techs. Um, they've got uh, all kinds of cameras, um, microphones, uh, things like that set up um, so we can uh, see everything in real time. Here's some oscillographs uh, that have been taken just on a, a, a typical system. Um, this one shows um, up at the top there uh, was an AC input failure. So the top channel one is the system output voltage, system output current on channel two, uh, bypass current on channel three, and uh, channel four is AC input current. So what we don't want to see during this test is the machine transferring to bypass. And if it did, we'd see on channel three uh, some change there. So the AC input was turned off and uh, at that point right there. And then the system is uh, operating from battery at that point. And we see there's no uh, changes uh, in the output there. That's exactly what we should see. This one here um, is uh, 
inverter failure. So they simulate an inverter failure. And the top channel again is output voltage. This is system output voltage. And um, channel two is output current. And channel three is bypass current. So we had uh, simulated an inverter fail. And right where the dotted, uh, the red vertical line is, shows where the transfer occurred. And uh, we trigger the oscilloscope off of the bypass current so we can capture it. Looking up above, you see there's no aberrations, uh, any kind of loss of power or anything uh, during an inverter failure. So that's the function of our static transfer switch to detect a potential inverter fail and get to bypass so the load never sees any difference. Um, low DC disconnect here uh, is looking at running on um, operating from a battery and when the uh, we get down to our minimum voltage uh, from the battery the uh, system will shut down and do a successful transfer and there again you can see it right there with the red line that it did uh, make a nice clean transfer and the load doesn't know the difference. So that's a transfer from inverter to the bypass source right there. Um, here's a load fault on the output. Now, this is a fault uh, put on the system output. And here, yeah, you do see a little aberration, but my goodness, it's a shorted output right there. The system does transfer to bypass, as noted by channel three. The bypass source has a whole motor control center behind it. It's a stiffer source. So in this condition, we're going to transfer to the bypass source and let the alternate source with that big motor control center behind it and all the power available there to clear the fault. That's just what the machine should do. Um, here's a short circuit test, which is different than a fault. In this case, we have a, uh, a high speed fuse. Um, looks like a 50 amp fuse right here, uh, which would simulate what you might have in a panel board, a branch circuit fault. Um, if you have uh, the uh, panel boards with fuses and switches in it. So we have the fault right there. And there's, again, no uh, disturbance on the output when we clear that fault. So this shows the capability of the machine to clear the fault. Okay, so this is just a few samples here. Um, there may be page after page of oscillographs uh, that we do during factory acceptance testing. So again, FAT verifies the system functions for the client spec. Now, when we talk about startup services, startup focuses on proper installation and operation. We try to encourage when we do startup services, we try to encourage operators to come out and participate in this because usually there's no critical load on the UPS system and operators can operate this system. They can take it offline, they can put it online, start it up, shut it down, do whatever they want to, to get comfortable with operating the machine. So when the time comes and it's critical, they've got that comfort level. So we try to encourage them um, to participate when possible. Um, during startup services, we can do some static load testing. Um, what we uh, often do, uh, our field engineers have uh, thermal cameras and we'll put whatever load we have available on the system. And then we shoot the uh, system with the uh, infrared camera uh, to look for hot spots and so on. 
doing a full battery of tests like we do at the factory on site is usually nearly impossible due to space constraints and having power sources and things like that. The nice thing about doing startup, having us come out and start the machine up is if there's an issue down the road, if we've done startup on it and confirmed it's operating, we don't have to dicker on what warranty, uh, who's responsible for what, if there's a warranty claim. Okay, so that's another advantage to do that. Uh, we know the machine, if we're doing startup, is operating properly when we left. To assure if we, uh, the startup goes smooth, um, we have a checklist we send out. Here it is right here. And it just asks all the questions. Um, are all the cables landed? Um, do we have HVAC in the room? Uh, do you need any special testing? Um, so on and so on. Um, we try to look at uh, the feeders uh, from the motor control centers, uh, making sure the uh, uh, breakers, uh, that we set the magnetic trips, uh, we prefer to set them at maximum, uh, especially for the AC input because there's an inrush current because it feeds a transformer. So things like that we're going to look for. So one thing we really look at when we're doing startup is any possible signs of shipping damage. Did this thing bounce around in a truck? Um, did something uh come loose uh something like that um we take the pictures of the machines before they leave the factory so we know how it left um sometimes when the machine uh, gets to the site uh, there's fans on top of the cabinet we have to pull the fans off and uh just to get them through the door sometimes those fans get lost or damaged. I think sometimes somebody needs a fan in a chicken coop or their barn or in their attic, and maybe that's where they end up at. I don't know, but uh, I, every now and then there's a mystery as to why the fans are no longer there. Debris in the cabinet. There's conduit entrance panels uh, on the top of the cabinet, and if need be on the bottom of the cabinet, these things have to be pulled off and punched and drilled outside the UPS. If we take the lazy way and punch them in place, then you get all kinds of metal shavings inside there, and nobody wants that. Oftentimes or sometimes uh, when we're pulling cable in the cabinet, the electrician's trying to get it in there, and he doesn't realize his elbow is... Uh, leaning on some other piece of equipment in the cabinet. So it's possible something gets damaged. And uh, if that happens, now's the time to get it fixed uh, uh, during startup here. Batteries. Um, batteries are one of the big concerns we have getting proper installation. Uh, they've got to be done per the manufacturer's, manufacturer's specifications, okay? They always send a manual out with the battery and it tells you how to install them and any kind of tests that are uh, required to maintain a warranty. Um, I'm not a battery expert. I don't claim to be, but there's a few things I know when I go on site if I'm doing a startup. The first thing I look at is the washers on the straps for the post. And that's what we see in the middle screen here. These washers are installed properly. And you ask yourself, well, how can you get them on wrong? Well, there's a right side and a wrong side on the washer. Washers are uh, stamped or punched when they're made. And there's a sharp edge on one side of the washer the washer has to be installed with the smooth edge down across the strap, 
And that's what the middle picture is showing here. The uh, edge with the sharp edge is up on top. If we get that turned over, that sharp edge cuts into the strap, exposes copper, which will re uh, eventually result in corrosion right there. So that's one thing I always look at anytime if I'm doing a startup or inspecting a battery. If the, all the washers, and there may be hundreds of them in a string of batteries, if they're all installed properly, that gives you a good basic feeling that the installer did the proper techniques and everything else should be done right also. On this picture on the left is a string of batteries. And if you look at the top row on the right side, the jumper wire down to the middle row, we tied two negative terminals together. That should always be uh, negative to positive there. So they've got the uh, jumpers installed backwards right here. Obviously, it's critical we get that straightened out before we turn a battery charger onto this. So that's just something we look at, making sure the battery voltage is correct, and of course, the polarity is correct. We've seen people get it backwards before, and it's never a good result if we don't catch that before we start turning the machine on. All right, um, phases reversed on a manual bypass switch. This is an error in my presentation right here. I didn't get this corrected. So we'll go right on to the next one here. And the remote manual bypass switch, which is on the right, um, and then the UPS cabinet on the left. I have went out and surveyed our field engineers and said, what do you see common mistakes that are made? And overwhelmingly, they came back and said, they get cables crossed up on the manual bypass switch. So obviously it's imperative we get these uh, corrected. Now I've shown it here uh, in a couple red lines there where they got them crossed up. The wire numbers on the manual bypass switch are the same as the wire numbers on the UPS cabinet. So all we have to do if we keep our cable straight is just match up wire numbers on each end. Okay. Of course, phase rotation is important here. If we get it I installed with the phase rotation reversed, the world doesn't come to an end. The LCD on the screen says, hey, phase rotation is reversed. All we do is shut the machine down, get the power off, and reverse it, typically back at the um, bypass transformer, feeding into the uh, manual bypass switch. Here again is just a picture of a uh, manual bypass switch. Um, you hear me harping on this because we really like to see these things get installed. It just promotes uh, safety for workers. So. Another issue we see um, when we're doing startups uh, for single phase systems. Here's a transformer typically used and from the factory, they're usually configured, and this is not us, this is, uh, these are usually just drop shipped, uh, but the manufacturer that builds a transformer, the secondaries, they're usually dual secondaries, and they're connected series aiding to give us 240 volts on the output. If the machine, which is typical, is 120 volts, we have to restrap this transformer. The two secondaries there get paralleled for 120 volts. Okay, I've seen this before. Uh, obviously, it's imperative we get that corrected before we turn the machine on. If you put 240 volts on 120 volt input, you're going to have damage to this system. Another thing we need to look at too um, is the primary, and we want to make sure that we select the right tabs 
on the primary. Now, here we show um, the standard connection uh, is um, for 480 volts, but let's suppose the uh, 480 bus runs at 460 volts. That's within spec. So we want to retap the primary of the transformer, change the taps to make sure we got uh, proper voltage or proper tap on the primary to give us our 120 volts out of the bypass transformer. Generally, we like to set it up so that we're running in the uh, low 120s um, to allow for some cable drop and stuff like that between the UPS and the um, and the panel board that it's going to feed. So we'll set this up, change the taps, so we're a little bit high coming out of the transformer, and then by the time it gets to the load, we should be dialed right in to around 120 volts, which is what we're looking for. Another thing we look at uh, in the machine uh, is multiple uh, neutral ground bonds. Neutral and ground should be bonded at only one point. If we get them tied at multiple places, then we're going to have neutral current and ground conductors, and uh, that can cause real problems during fault conditions. So neutral and ground uh, can be tied at several points, but only one point. And we don't come in and tell you where to do it. The engineer can decide um, how this is set up. We just verify that we only do it at one point. Something else that amazes me, um, we've got alarm contacts um, on every machine. And oftentimes, they're, they're specced out uh, for a number of different possibilities, but they never get wired in. And uh, there's always a common alarm or trouble alarm with the system. And then there's individual contacts, and there's the trouble alarm right there. But oftentimes, they series up all these contacts and include them with the trouble alarm. And it would seem redundant to do that. We'd like to see those brought out to different points if they're available in the control room. So the operators have a better idea of what's going on there. Infrared camera, um, I mentioned. This is the FLIR camera that all our field engineers use. And again, we shoot the machine once we got it up and operating and look for any hot spots. So in this case right here, um, this was uh, taken by one of our field engineers. Usually you look for hot spots, but in this case at the very top, there's a transformer up there that should be at least warm and it's ice cold. And the reason is, here it is on the uh, right, this transformer did not get connected up. It was bypassed when it was installed. So there was interconnecting cables uh, between two cabinets that had to land on this transformer and it didn't get installed. And uh, fortunately, our field engineer caught this when he shot this. I, I thought this was such a great find right there. Normally, you look at hot spots. And here, it's um, a cold spot that was the issue. Now, here's a battery under discharge. Uh, great application for this FLIR camera right here. Notice all the other terminals of the battery. There's no heat there. But here's the one hot spot right there. So a loose connection or possible um, uh, corroded connections on a battery terminal shows right up. This may not show up just in routine testing, but the camera knocks that out for us. Um, oscillographs 
we take them at the factory and when we come out uh, to your site, uh, we take more of the same thing. We know the machine's going to operate okay, but getting all these oscillographs here, it gives us a picture. We can show you the client that the machine's operating okay. So our field engineers, they don't like it. They got to haul around an oscilloscope and other equipment, but that's what it takes here to make sure we can show you when we come out there, this thing's working right. So here again, it's just transfers from inverter to bypass. Same thing the other oscillographs did, uh, just assuring everything's working okay. Here's one that shows the inverter synchronized. And you only see one channel here, but it's because the uh, inverter and the bypass are superimposed right on top of each other because they are synchronized. So we know it really is in sync there. And it gives us a picture of it. We don't have to rely on a light. That's the end of my presentation. Um, do we have any comments there? Yeah, we do. Um, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask, now is the time to put them into the, the chat bar. And we do have one question already, and it's uh, an interesting question that hopefully you may be able to answer on. Describe how the UL personnel participate in the UL certification. Boy, I'd like to be able to give a great answer on that. Um, I don't get involved um, with the... Uh, I'm sorry to say uh, the UL testing is done off site. I think we ship the machines out to a site for testing. Um, yeah, so I, on that I, point, I, basically we don't UL test every single piece of equipment. If we say no. we make a DPP model, then we'll, what you're saying, Don, is we send that uh, prototype out to the UL lab or a, an external contracting company who does UL certification and it gets UL listed one time and then we follow that for every other machine. Is that correct? Yeah, that I mis I misunderstood the question. Yes. Um, we go out, uh, when we get like a new product line, um, we uh, do the proper UL testing uh, at a lab, um, whatever is required there. And then um, the pro and it may be multiple machines we have to do, but then the whole uh, product line is certified for UL. So in rare cases, do we ever do any uh, additional uh, UL testing? Then? Okay. okay. Uh, that's good. We'll just wait uh, a few more minutes to see if anybody else has uh any more questions and it doesn't have to be limited to the topic today obviously you've spent your time over the last 45 minutes uh listening to this presentation but if something um comes up that pops in your head anything related to ups systems just pop that into the chat bar and we'll see what we can do um i, so I do see greg i do see a question asked here um uh some e-house integrators ask that to be done at their factory, uh, is it possible to set up FAT at um, customer site, um, the integrator site? I know uh, we do uh, work with some of those. Now, I think what they, uh, what I've seen done, um, we go out. There's some local companies in Houston we've worked with, and I don't know we do FAT so much there, but we do start up the machine. Uh, as it's installed in, like if it's one of these remote uh, instrument buildings, something like that. Um, yeah, um, basically the limitations that we always have, it's a very good question. The limitations that we always have to be able to do a full fat test anywhere out with the factory is having the ability to change voltages. Um, so, you know, as part of a fat test, we have to test the the low and the high voltage input levels to the input of the rectifier and see that the alarms come in at the correct set point. If we don't have a variac, which we, we don't have that piece of equipment that we can ship around the country. So we can't do that kind of testing. So 
just like Don says, it's usually just a startup that we do when we go to local e-house integrators. Um, we, we make sure they have the correct power and we go through our startup procedure. Um, Craig, we had another question here. Um, somebody's uh, asking about um, yeah, the uh, chart. Are you, are you going to? Uh, I'll get back. Okay. If, uh, so while Craig's getting back to the charger, um, uh, that's like the second or third slide, I think it is. Um, what, uh, what's the question? Uh, Basically, you're saying, can we go over the schematic that we showed? So, Jared, if you want to, uh, is there something in particular that you want us to clarify um, within that schematic? You always find the limitations to things when you have to do this. It doesn't yeah. have the ability to press go to uh, start. It's not like a normal PowerPoint. Oh, there we are. So the, uh... I suppose basically all okay. we, yeah, all we can say is, uh, as Don said, we have 480 volts coming in here, um, and that comes from an MCC, then that goes into our UPS. So the dotted line is the input to our UPS, and there will be terminals, three phase terminals inside the UPS here, and then this breaker will be our AC input breaker, um, and uh, that's how you apply power to the uh, input of the system and then that goes to this isolation transformer and this isolation transformer it's uh, 480 volts to roughly around about 130 volts on the secondary for a 60 cell battery um, that's what it would be and then the rectifier basically what rectification means is changing ac into dc so this rectifier here will change that three phase 130 volt signal going in to 135 volts for a 60 cell battery. And uh, a lot of people get confused. They think this 135 volts number, they wonder where it comes from. And it's dictated by the battery manufacturer. Okay, that is the only reason the charger puts out 135 volts is to keep the battery charged at exactly the correct level to prolong its life and to make sure it has its full charge. So that 135 volts bus also gets connected to the inverter. And the inverter is just the opposite of uh, a rectifier. It changes the DC back into AC. And uh, for a single phase system, it's 120 volts AC usually. But once again, as Don mentioned earlier, we do have systems uh, you can get 240 volt, uh, 240, 120 split phase. You can have 208, 120, three phase, or you can have 480 volts, three phase out. Uh, we do all of the, and we actually do 600 volts for Canada and other places as well. So we are completely customizable on our inputs and outputs. And then that 120 volts then goes through a static switch. And a static switch is really exactly what it says it is. It's a switch that has no moving parts, okay? It's completely electronic. And you can send a signal to these SCRs here uh, to tell them to turn on, and they will turn on and allow power to flow both ways, because obviously it's sinusoidal. That's why we have two SCRs. And then that power flows out to our AC output, either through a manual bypass switch on the UPS, or sometimes we will have, um, as Don says, what we recommend is you have an R, I'm trying to write with the mouse and it's not very good, an R MBS, which is a remote manual bypass switch, which allows us to isolate the system for maintenance uh, if necessary. And then the only reason we have a bypass source is just in case the inverter fails or the battery discharges past its uh, end of voltage point. What will happen is the inverter will then turn off and our sensing circuit will say, okay, we have no power going through this static switch anymore. And it will instantaneously switch on the bypass static switch, this static switch here, and allow power from your MCC directly from the grid power. Um, your bypass will be able to feed the load and there will be no interruption, which is where you get the uninterruptible, uninterruptible power supply. So um, hopefully, Jarrett, that explains 
the single line in more detail. Do you have anything to add, Don? Uh, no, I thank you. Uh, I'm going. I I can't let it go without okay, some go comment. <laughs> Just the uh, the static switch um, is a make before break transfer, and um, the the. Just the operation of thigh wristers. Um, and just a quick review: uh, a thigh wrister or SCR, whatever you prefer to call it. Once you turn it on, it is uh, it's, continues to conduct until the current goes through, uh, stops going through it. That's when it does what we call naturally commutates off, which would be at the zero crossing, going from negative to positive or positive to negative. So. If something says transfer to bypass and we're in the peak of the positive half cycle, even though we say swap to bypass at that point, we remove the drive signal from the SCR. It stays turned on until we get to the zero crossing. But in the meantime, we bring on the bypass SCR. So what happens during every transfer the inverter and the bypass parallel together for a brief interruption, which the great thing about it is, is it assures there's no break in the output. Obviously, the inverter needs to be synchronized to the bypass if we're going to parallel them together. But that's just, uh, just a little note there on how the static switch works. Cool. Good stuff. Uh, Randy's asked, what is the expected life of an Amatec QPS? I think we're uh, in the 30 year range, um, uh, certainly 20, but uh, geez, we, uh, the sales team is going to kill me for saying this, but we see these things run 40 and 50 years sometimes. And um, we got an awful lot of machines. It doesn't seem like the 80s were that long ago, but those machines are 40 years old. There's a lot of them out there running. The downside is, it is hard to support that stuff. Um, people don't make parts for like they did in 1980 and even before. So it is a struggle, a constant struggle to still support them. But we, I think we look at end of life around the 20 to 30 year range. Yeah. And just to confirm what Don says, I know that within the last month, one of our field service engineers was working on a, a 50 year old UPS. It's still running. So uh, they are out there. Um, and a lot of clients, you know, it can be an absolute nightmare trying to uh, either get permission or an outage to remove a complete UPS and replace it. So there are some people who will replace the, the magnetics, the transformers, and uh, do a full PM10 where you replace all of the capacitors, all of the SCRs, um, everything within the UPS pretty much. Um, and apart from the cables, you've got a brand new UPS. So there are customers who go down that route as well. Once again, new sales team will kill us for saying that, but hey, we're in service. So, so. <laughs> uh, and Craig, I have to add a comment here. I think it's really uh, useful and important. Um, if you're planning the replacement of a machine, if it was put in in the 70s, 60s, 80s, something like that, it probably did not have a remote manual bypass switch. And if you're, say, I'm budgeting for a, a new machine, and maybe in a year or two we're going to do that, in the meantime, when you go into a turnaround or a scheduled outage, you can install a remote manual bypass switch when you can afford downtime. And then when it comes time to install the new UPS, maybe a year or two later, you bypass the UPS with the remote switch, completely isolate it. And if you've got a critical load up, you can keep it running and change the whole UPS cabinet out online. So that's something to plan for. And RMBS remote bypass switches are not that expensive. And it's not hard to budget for that versus replacing the whole UPS. So that's something to consider there. Absolutely. It just makes everybody's life easy when you have an RMBS. There's no doubt you can completely 
isolate the machine electrically uh, to do work on it. It makes everybody's life safer. And like Don says, it can allow you to completely change the UPS with your load circuit still being powered. So um, really is a good idea. Uh, we have somebody asking who performs our, our shake test qualifications. Do you know who it is, Don? Uh, the seismic testing, geez, I, it's been 20 years since I've been in, involved with that. We used to do it at Wiley Labs uh, down in Huntsville, which uh, Wiley Labs did a, a bunch of uh, the NASA stuff right there. And these days, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know who it is. Okay. I don't. I don't know if Wiley's still there or not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have seen a video of one over the last few years, but I don't know where it came from. Well, good point. There, I think we got a YouTube video up there um, of one uh, uh, inver nuclear grade inverter uh, bolted down to the shaker table. It makes your teeth hurt just to watch. It. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Uh, we've got another question. What is the recommended PM frequency by Amatech personnel? I'll take that question. Um, we say that you should do annuals, um, five yearly PMs and 10 yearly PMs. And one of the main reasons that we recommend this is that when, when you get an Amatech field service engineer that, to come out and do a PM on your UPS, that gives you a bumper to bumper warranty for the full next 12 months until we return to that system. So if we go in there and we do an annual PM and something happens from that point onwards for 12 months, we will come out and fix your UPS parts and labor absolutely free of charge, um, except for I think travel and living expenses. Um, I'd have to check on that, but you get a full warranty. So. An annual inspection will replace on our fair resonance systems, will replace any critical relays um, and lamps if necessary. Uh, for a five year PM, we'll do fans um, and lamps. Basically, it's as per the manufacturer's recommendations. So we use um, EBM or perhaps fans, I can't remember which one it is. Um, but the fan manufacturer says, okay, those have a, f a five year life at the temperatures that you. Uh, predict your UPS will run at. So that's why we replace our fans after five years. And then the 10 years is capacitors, fans, and we recommend doing the printed circuit boards as well because there are capacitors on the printed circuit boards as well. And electric electrolytic capacitors have a 10-year ten, ten lifespan at the temperatures that we run at. So that is why we replace them every 10 years. Um, and the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, when we come out and we do our annual inspections, we're usually exercising the, the bypass switch. And it can be very important to do that because a lot of the manufacturers of the switches will tell you if you don't exercise those switches, then you're allowing uh, buildup and corrosion to get into the contacts. Because when you do operate a switch, um, they have a wiper mechanism that wipes off the surfaces of the contacts uh, when you move from one position to another. So um, operating those switches, exercising those switches is really important too. So that's our recommended PM frequency. So uh, Craig, I see one here. Uh, um, uh, one of our in-house personnel responded um we got a request for i think it was preventive maintenance uh for a, man, a machine manufactured in 1976. that's when i graduated from high school <laughs> i can barely remember that so that's uh geez that machine's been around uh and, and it's still out there chugging so you yeah. gotta like that yeah one of our sales guys just reminded me that uh, the warranty only covers the internals of the system um, up to transformers and batteries. Transformers and batteries are not covered by the warranty. But we do have um, our CSA offering, which is our, I can't remember what CSA stands for now. Customers. Uh, Client service agreement, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Um, and basically, it's um, uh, usually a three to five year plan that you would buy and it gives you full coverage of the whole system Ooh, we're getting into sales mode i feel a bit uneasy about so, this <laughs> yeah so uh craig randy uh asks um is the rmbs a standard feature on a new machine 
Uh, I wish it was, um, but the uh, system engineer, uh, whoever's spec specking out the machine, um, is the one who will, will call that out. If we're doing our job up front, we work with the engineers and help them understand the benefit to that. And again, it seems to be it's just a standard, uh, apparently word of mouth or tribal knowledge. Most people spec those in these days. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I think that is about it. Our hour, hour, hour is up. So thank you, Don. Um, really appreciate your time today. As Brooke has mentioned in the chat bar, um, if you'd like to learn more about any of our client support and services, she's put in the link for that. And she's also uh, let you know that this um, presentation will be recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. And there is a link for that, uh, usually within 24 hours of this happening. So if you want to go back and watch this and you can fast forward and rewind it, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can also use the registration link that you were sent to register for this webinar to watch a replay of this webinar if you want to as well. The problem with that replay is that you cannot fast forward, pause, rewind, um, and get to parts that you want to. Once you press start, you have to watch it from the start to the finish within Webinar Jam. So it's much better to wait the 24 hours and go to our YouTube channel. Um, and as always, um, on the website that Brooke has posted, there will be a contact um, button and you can contact us. And uh, if you have any other questions, then feel free to get in contact with us and let us know. So I think that's about it. Once again, thanks, Don. Thank you to everybody who took the time out of their day to watch this presentation. Um, sorry for the technical mishap at the start and delaying the, the webinar by 10 minutes. Um, now we will try and make sure that doesn't happen in the future. And uh, take care until next time. And everybody in Houston, stay warm because uh, it's not nice out there. Take care, everybody. Thanks again, and we'll speak to you next month.